also reflected here in this very So now coming back to the effects of interaction, we can plot this. We have seen this picture already a couple of times. I didn't know that when I prepared the talk. So here it is again. This is a 3D version. This is the 1D cut of this 3D version. What you have here in the center, or here, is the Coulomb attraction, which is the singularity at the origin. And then what else? Then we have the cut of the Coulomb potential by the dead red here. And then we have, say, field times set, if the field is uh, directed along the positive set direction, it's this one here. And then out here, you see that the Coulomb potential is small, therefore this asymptote is, dominant, is determined by the F set term, and likewise here it's determined by the F set term. So this is the effective potential, and under uh, particular circumstances or conditions, I form this effective uh, barrier through which the electric can turn. So this is the problem that we will look at today, and uh, later in the talk we will add nuclei to this problem. Uh, so when is this applicable? Uh, this we have not discussed in so well, it was mentioned earlier today also. Now I give you the, the original argument here uh, uh, provided in the paper uh, of Kelvish. So we look at this problem again. Let's introduce uh, some new uh, Simple here, this we like as theoreticians, of course. So the ionization potential will now be called kappa squared half. Let's determine the exit point here. As you see from the figure, at the exit point, the Coulomb potential is small compared to the F set term. At the exit point, I therefore say that the potential is dominated solely by F times Z naught, where Z naught is the exit point I want to uh, determine. And you see here from the figure that this Z naught should be equal to the ionization potential. From this, I isolate Z0, the exit point. Now, classically, you would say, how long time does it take for an electron to reach that point Z0? Well, it takes a distance divided by the typical uh, velocity, uh, which is the same as this kappa here uh, in these atomic units. So this is, the, so to speak, the time it takes from, for the electron to go here, so to go from here to here, in some sense, which I will not specify. And then we, <laughs> we have here, we have here uh, a typical time scale for variations in the external field. So if this omega is the frequency, one of omega is the time scale, one half is the time scale for when the field points in the positive set direction compared to negative set direction. Then I can form this ratio between the time it takes the electron to go to this exit point uh, and the typical time scale of the field, and plugging in these uh, symbols here, I end up with this so-called Kelvish parameter, which in these symbols is simply <laughs> the frequency of the field, kappa over f. So what we see here is that if now I have a small frequency or a high field, this number can be very small. What does it mean? It means that the field, so to say, points in this direction, positive set direction, for a long time compared to the electronic motion. This is the physics. Of this. Uh, if that condition is fulfilled, but this number is much more than one, you will find statements like the electron has time to tunnel before the field changes direction. So this is the field, uh, this is the regime we're interested in. Uh, in fact, uh, it's not enough that this gamma here is smaller than one to apply a tunneling theory. Uh, you also need, of course, that somehow the energy in the field compared to the ionization potential should be much smaller than one. Because if this is much more than one, the time scale of the laser variation is much slower than the time scale of the electron motion. And then in this regime, the field is an adiabatic changing external parameter, and you can use adiabatic theory. And that's a, the that's a theoretical justification for using tunneling theory to describe uh, processes that uh, happen in a time dependent. Questions to this? That's clear. Then we can uh, look at the problem again. Here's my system. I apply the field in the positive set direction. The, if, if the system breaks up, the electrons will fly in this direction, the nuclei will fly in this direction. Uh, <clears throat> then I put something here, and 
this means, when, <coughs> I'll come back, back to this on the next slide, when you have such a system here which fly apart, you, we solve the Schrodinger equation without going away from the condition. And this turns the problem into something which is called the Seeger problem or Gamow state problem. And this means that the entities are no longer uh, real, but the eigen uh, entities in the field are complex with a real part and an imaginary part which is related to the rate of tunneling. Uh, so this, this is, there's a big literature on this type of stuff. The, the, you can see this is like a width of the state and it corresponds to the tunneling rate. I might be getting a little bit ahead of where we are, but uh, how relevant, how important is it that you're not considering the be stationary? Uh, at, at this point, it's not. Uh, this is completely general. This statement is true when the nuclei do not move, and also true when they move. Okay. Uh, it's, just, well, it's just, of course, much more difficult to solve when the nuclei move. Well, right. So say I see your your graph, and I immediately think to myself, if I was to try to make a simulation of this, I would not have moving nuclei. I would have to fix. Yeah. Well, that's uh, of course. Uh, Valid approach, but it's all wrong. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, there are cases when it's wrong. At least you have this. We will discuss in detail later. But I can say now that under some conditions it's very wrong. Under other conditions, you have to at least include some nuclear motion in some high way, or maybe via some uh, averaging over some perturbation drastic way. So anyway, uh, here I s I'm right in text what I just told, told you that when we solve this uh, equation without going away boundary condition, it creates these secret states or gamma states. This this is something which uh, I have found is not uh, a well known. Uh, it's kind of standard quantum uh, mechanics courses. It's not really described. Uh, you can find excellent pedagogical papers on this type of stuff in uh, American Journal of Physics. And you can also, if you like, uh, try yourself to solve uh, a problem like this, 1D problem, 1 uh, degree of freedom x, and then you can try and build such a, a rectangular potential. And what, what, how to set up this problem, I'll just sketch it here, and then you can try yourself, and I'll be happy to assist you. you here, of course, you can have waves going both ways. Here, you will have waves go in both ways, but here you only have outgoing waves. This is what it means to have outgoing wave number conditions. And then you will see when you do this that you get a complex solution. Um, here we don't want, I mean, of course when we do the theory, we, we, we solve some problems at the initial, the right way, and this involves some, typically some army propagation techniques and other things. This I will not go into detail in, in this talk. I'm rather focused here on the analytical approach. And, and to do that, let's just discuss a little bit uh, the, the, the strategy here. The strategy here is maybe, it could be illustrated in this kind of model system, but let's just try and illustrate it straight, straight away in the real uh, physical system, where we somehow assume that I have the field along the set direction. So here's the field again. This is the F set term. I have, I have the Coulomb potential somewhere here. Oops. And then I build the effective potential. <coughs> like this. And now I, I consider this state here. <coughs> In tunneling theory, when we do the analytical approaches that I will discuss, we assume that the ground state is not really much affected, at least in the leading order theory. So we have some ground state here. And then the whole trick is to match here in this region on the barrier to a solution which is outgoing out here, but continuated into this classically forbidden region. So these are the, now I gave you already the steps, and I will come back to these steps later in the talk and make this more clear. But the, the idea is that you have a, a bound state which has already a tail out here in a region which overlaps with an outgoing wave. Okay. This, of course, you, this picture you can also try and, and use here in the analysis of such a problem. 
Excuse me. Yeah. I'm a bit confused by this complex energy solution. So yeah. uh, the Hamiltonian uh, the Hamiltonian is supposed to be Hermitian, right? And yeah. No, but then, uh, yeah. But when you both those has... outgoing wave boundary conditions, is no longer Hermitian. Okay. Uh, and what? what yeah. This this I cannot uh, go into more detail now. Why, why this is the case? Then we have to uh, sit and look at this carefully together. Maybe someone else has a good comment at this point. Well, does it, I thought that the uh, the operators had to be Hermitian because only Hermitian operators are observable. And if it's a complex energy solution, then the full solution isn't going to be observable anyway because we can't observe mm -hmm. imaginary values. So uh, I think that's the to, to within the uncertainty principle, yes, you will not be able to observe it, right? But in the, I mean, this is the whole idea of having a, a decay time or a decay lifetime. To these so. But the Hamiltonian does not have a stationary solution at those energies. Uh, but you have a. Yes. You can. Yeah. I Part of the outgoing complex wave function is affected by these exciting states of energy. No, but I think that I think that he's concerned that the norm of the wave function is not going to be conserved, which which is just a physical statement that you lose your yes, your particles. Yes, sir. That's really what it means. This is what it means. <coughs> the, the norm is of course decaying at exactly right. this this rate. Uh, so but that's part of the outgoing wave. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Right, and they don't come. Back. They cannot come back, so you lose. Yeah. You lose your. In some other, uh, maybe you know some other uh, examples in atomic physics where you have a, a similar but different situation. For well, example, spontaneous emission is the most famous example, maybe. Spontaneous emission. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. This is what. This is one example right. which we all have had in some course at some point. Right. Yeah. But also, if you want to have more exotic example in atomic physics, you can talk, think about a double excited state or multiply excited state in some atom, which couples uh, to a continuum also. So when you have a coupling to a continuum, you have this decay, and it's the same here because you know, this this. This is the copy to the continuum because you can go through this barrier. So now uh, let's uh, look at the history of tunneling. This is now the tunneling rate in hydrogen. And uh, here are some authors that worked on this in the 20s. Right. And uh, here you have the tunneling rate. You see uh, it is an exponent which involves the field. And if you look at how this f is, you will see that if the field is large, it's a larger probability for tunneling than if it's small. And all of these authors are correct, in fact, in the exponent. Uh, but only the last authors are correct in the prefect. Uh, so this I just show you because it adds to the history that this is not a super easy problem. It's not traditional perturbation theory get this kind of stuff uh, out correctly. Uh, in fact, the first time this was done correctly was in this textbook on, of Landau and Lisch. It's in the English version from 58. They discussed this, but of course, it's uh, probably not considered to be important enough to discuss in the main text. Rather, it's discussed in a problem. So the problem is to determine the probability of ionization of a hydrogen atom in the ground state in a strong electric field. Then there is also a sketch of the solution here, uh, but this is in fact not so easy to uh, to, to to follow. So uh, yeah, this we will come back to. So uh, more history on this. The theory that uh, you need to to apply here is uh, is, is a symptotic theory. It's this kind of theory that you need to apply to get this rate correct because it's not conventional. <coughs> it's basic theory. It's called a symptotic theory. And it's an asymptotic theory that uh, assumes the field to be weak. So therefore, we refer to this as, to, to this as weak field asymptotic theory. Um, and the general structure of the rate will be a leading order term 
and some possibly correct symptoms. <coughs> For spherical symmetric potentials, meaning atoms, Oppenheimer got this exponent uh, right. Lambda and Lipschitz got uh, A, B, and C right for the hydrogen atom in the ground state. Uh, these authors got uh, A, B, and C right for the general atom in an N, L, M state. Uh, these authors consider stark states in the hydrogen, special uh, in parabolic coordinates, and got uh, A, B, and C right and even obtained some corrections. So this, this was pretty uh, well understood relatively early on. Now, uh, for arbitrary potentials for molecules in our case, <coughs> nothing was, uh, not a lot of stuff was done. And that, that was probably mainly due to the fact that there was not so much experimental activity on molecules until maybe the 90s, immediately, uh, in particular from Paul Koch and his collaborators. But then a lot of experiments appeared, and there was a lack of tunneling theory for molecules. Uh, and the, I want to highlight here the so-called molecular ADK theory, which is a tunneling theory for molecules, which cannot be derived rigorously, but which was put in the literature based on some uh, um, intuitive, well-justified physical arguments, taking the atomic case and generalizing it to the molecular case. Uh, but uh, in fact, <coughs> this coefficient here is wrong for polar molecules in the MOADK and there's also some inconsistency in the, in the way you structure the theory. So this was the situation. Then I have been involved in some works uh, later which uh, addressed this problem and, and uh, actually also solved it for the first time. So this is uh, the main theme for this talk. And now you, you may also ask why, why, how can it be uh, correct to say weak? Why is the field weak? Because we talk about strong field physics. And uh, for this, maybe one way to see this is maybe to, to discuss a little bit atomic units. Uh, the, if I have an intensity of 3.51 uh, times 10 to the 6, 16 watts per square centimeter, this is the intensity that corresponds to one atomic unit of intensity. So if I, if I now have, uh, if I now want to have some intensity in atomic units, I take this intensity in watts per square centimeter and divide by this I know what. Then I have the intensity, and then I get the field strength in atomic units as just the square root of the intensity in atomic units. Oops. So this is the way it's done. And, and uh, as you as you probably know, typical field strength, uh, typical intensities are around 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter, meaning that this one number here is typically smaller than one, uh, significantly smaller than one, leading to smaller than one field strength. I know the atomic unit of electric field <coughs> is the electric field held by an electron in the ground state of magnetism. Yes, it's which should be different from that. Yeah, it, it, it depends a little bit on what factors you absorb here, because there is uh, factors of A, I, and F. You know, this this is one convention. That is, this is like a convention. So that many people follow this convention. And, and if you if you follow a slightly different convention, the conclusion would be the same. So so the fields that are of relevance here uh, are uh, weak because these are the fields that I use Okay, so that's, uh, so now why, why, is, why was this thing about the molecule, why was this difficult? Uh, one thing is that, for example, you have now one, two, three centers. So if now a, th a three uh, central problem instead of just the one central problem, that's, that makes it more difficult. Furthermore, you have the complication that, as you see here, uh, it seems that it's different if the field points this way, then if the field points this way, because if the field points this way, I drag the electrons to this side, and if it points that way, I drag the electrons to this side. So this is something we have to uh, be able to describe. Um, and uh, you also have uh, star shifts here. This I, I uh, denote here by this formula. So just this, this is interesting. You see, you have normal perturbation theory for the energy, but unconventional perturbation theory 
for the rate. Uh, the, the energy of a system in the presence of a field is the energy with no field minus the dipole times the field and then maybe some possibility uh, induced dipole term. This, I think here you, you don't need to uh, have this in mind. But if we just consider this, you also see that there's a different shift here. Uh, if the dipole is parallel to the field, I get a higher ionization potential than if it's anti parallel. Let's just make a drawing of this also. It's kind of illustrative physically. I think we need some new pins for the rest of the meeting. Uh, can you can you see can you uh, see what I write here? No. They're very weak the pens. <laughs> I try anyway. So so now if the field is zero, so I have some energy. Now I have a situation where the field is not zero. Then this will split up. I just uh, draw this formula. <coughs> I sketch the result of that formula into two lines here, where the first one will be the opposite one corresponding to uh, that the field, say, is in this direction and the dipole is in the opposite direction. Right? Whereas this one, I have the field and the dipole in the same direction. And if this is the ionization threshold up here, you see that the ones that are anti-parallel with the with the field will have a small ionization potential, and it's the ionization potential that determines how easy it is to ionize. Right? So that's one effect. And uh, <coughs> so now, uh, come, if we come back to that, we can at least for the molecules, we have to at least use a generalization of the molecular ADK based <coughs> on some adiabatic picture, uh, namely include a habit dependent field. A field dependent carbon here, a field dependent uh, binding by this type of form. And this is now uh, this uh, sketch here I illustrated. And this is just for me to remember that I should make a more figure of the enemies. I have done this, I can continue. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, now, uh, and then uh, after Paul's talk this morning, I wanted to, to illustrate uh, one of his statements, namely. Um, that uh, the direction of the field with respect to the system matters, and you can then take that into account, and you can get a long way with then subsequent classical propagation. Right? So you have a molecule, you have the field going around. If it's circular, for example, the circular field, you will have in one half plane, you will have the field parallel with the dipole. In the other half plane, you have it anti-parallel with the dipole. So when the field points say in this direction, the energy shifts up. It's easier to find. So all the all the electrons that are ejected here are ejected in one uh, uh, in this when the field points in that direction. And then if you uh, do this uh, classical uh, calculation, which maybe you did already in the break for uh, an electron in a circular polarized field, you will see then that this is enough to uh, explain. Uh, such an asymmetry in the photoelectric momentum distribution, uh, which was observed some years ago. So in, in that work here, we had uh, an, an uh, orient OCS molecule and a circular polarized light. And the only thing uh, that was needed to uh, uh, explain the main uh, observable was an interdependent rate uh, and then a classical state. So this is uh, what I'm saying. So, but then uh, there are also many cases where we don't, uh, where we can't explain what we see. I don't want to uh, uh, go into detail here, but I just mentioned that uh, in COO, CO2 OCS, there are uh, data where uh, tunneling theory cannot explain really what is seen. So this, of course, can be due to the fact that the experiments are not uh, performed in, in a regime where uh, tunneling theory is uh, applicable, but it can also be maybe because the tunneling theory is not entirely correct. Uh, so this is uh, motivating, of course, us to look more into this tunneling theory 
and also it's of course motivating that if they need to key process in many strong field physics uh, works. So now I will have a few slides where I try to guide you through uh, some of the argumentations yeah, that or some of the thoughts you need to do. Yeah. So, but I mean, experiment also directly ionizes the electrons, right? Yes. So, but if the theory does not include that, can it have a full picture? No, I mean the experiment. Yeah, so the feed, yeah, so the experiments. Uh, some of these are performed in circular polarized light. Some of them are performed in linear polarized light. That's already a complication. In the linear polarized light, we have rescattering. In the circular, we have no rescattering. Uh, and so therefore, I mean, you have to do more than just considering the rate. But at least you have to get the rate correct before you can build more theory. And now if you rate have for I, rate for the rate for ionization. ionization. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that, that at least has to be correct in order to have uh, the correct final result. And uh, now the question is also whether the experiments are performed in a regime where you have tunneling as a dominant ionization mechanism, or they are performed in a regime where there is some you could say non adiabatic uh, effects, or you could say maybe even over the barrier, because if the field is strong enough, there is no tunnel in there with the tunnel field. So now I will give you some. Yeah. May I ask what keeps the molecule aligned? Yes, the this, is, uh, this is a good question. So the question was what, what aligns the molecule or what orients the molecule? Uh, there are many techniques. If now it's a polar molecule with a dipole, you can just apply a static field and use basically that the energy where you have this dipole, where you have the dipole aligned with the field, is the, uh, is the one which uh, leads to the smallest energy. If it's, uh, if it's not a, so, but then maybe you don't want to do that because then you don't have the molecule under field free conditions. Then you can apply some pulse. Do what is called in the case of alignment, you can do impulsive alignment. This means that you create a coherent uh, rotation wave packet, <coughs> and uh, this can also be done. So, there are a few techniques that are In Enormous, uh, Henrik Stelbefeld, who was uh, the leader of the experiment, or who is the leader of the experimental lab that performed this type of experiments. He, he, he has a lot of techniques for doing alignment. So, now I want to come back to the theory. So now there will be some technical things. And this is the main paper that we have uh, worked on. And uh, you, you may find it odd, why should I stress one of my own paper in a graduate school? Well, the fact is that no one else has done the tunneling theory correctly for a molecule. Molecular system. So that, that, that I couldn't mention anyone. So we did this correctly for the first time. If you want a more pedagogical introduction, we, with a student some years ago, we actually unfolded this problem uh, of Landau and Bissi. So we 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 took we took that problem and wrote it out. <laughs> so this is uh, maybe worth publishing or trying to. So we published that in this pedagogical. <laughs> So this, this you can maybe also, if you like, you can have a look. So this is of course easier to read than this one. But this one only works for me. So uh, if we start with uh, hydrogen, uh, here is our tunneling problem again. There is no way to uh, treat this tunneling problem without having some kind of 1D motion as you study. You have to have some 1D motion, otherwise <coughs> Design a tunneling theory. You have to have a 1D uh, motion for the tunneling uh, electron. And uh, this you can do for hydrogen because for hydrogen uh, the problem separates in a particular set of coordinates which are called parabolic coordinates. And what do I mean by separation? I just mean that the solution is, can be written as a product of functions of eta and xi and uh, and 
And of course, you, maybe you don't know the separation for, in this particular set of coordinates, but you definitely know separation uh, in, 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 uh, in spherical coordinates. Uh, so this is uh, now in those uh, other coordinates which we use here. And when you do that, you get uh, two 1D Schrodinger equations, one for uh, Xi and one for Eta. And what is important here is that the motion in Xi is, this is the field-free one, this is the field uh, addressed potential. So you see in here where the initial downstream is, there's not a big change in the potential. This is one of the key uh, physical inputs into this field. In fact, what the field does is that it, may, it even increases the potential, so it increases the binding in this one coordinate. The other coordinate, on the other hand, in our rotation, the heater coordinate, we have this one when there is no field, and when there is a field, we have this one. So here you have the time there. So in the theory, uh, you go into the avoid coordinates and compute the timing problem in these coordinates. And this is also what we now uh, can, yeah. Uh, this is also what we want to do in the case of molecules, because if I have some uh, molecule here and I take out an electron, asymptotically, it sees a Coulomb potential, right? So if I take one electron out from any, uh, any system, if it's far enough away, it's still a Coulomb potential. It's just the monopole that survives. This means that asymptotically, we always have this separation. And this is a key point when you read the theory. Uh, here I plotted uh, some equal value surfaces or lines in the xz uh, plane uh, for a fixed eta, such that we can see how this occurs. Uh, and in particular, if z is large, negative, which means in the tunneling direction here, eta is more or less minus 2 times z. Okay, so now it's getting. And then now, the, now there are really technical slides here. So this one here we all know. This is just a swirling equation. And this one here you don't know, most likely. But it's easy to get, because the only thing I have done is that I have re-expressed this kinetic energy operator and the other uh, <coughs> uh, uh, coordinates here in terms of these uh, parabolic coordinates. And then I have a differential operator with respect to eta. And then I have uh, some other factors here, depending on energy and then I have collected a bunch of terms in this operator, which is a function of eta, as a parameter, but it's really an, an operator of xi and phi. Why do I do that? I do that because then I can, uh, for example, choose to work in a basis where I pick a fixed value of eta and find the eigenvalue and eigenfunction for this one. This is this we call an adiabatic basis. And as in totally, this operator here, in fact, becomes independent of eta, so I can define asymptotic channels. <coughs> this, this number, so this, the point here is that up here, this is like an adiabatic parameter. This is like capital R for, um, like in the Bonobo approximation. But here is the tunneling coordinate, which is true. Down here, it disappeared because this operator is independent of eta at large distance. And then I have a channel. So this channel here, is nothing else, and you see it's a, it's a channel which is a function of xi and phi, so it's nothing else but this new index is nothing else but a specification of where am I in this xi coordinate, right? And uh, then when I have such a basis, I can of course completely general expand my statement that this is also without approximations. This is like if you, if, if to make a parallel, you can when, when you do, if you want to do a molecule, you can have, for example, an Oppenheim state here, and then you can expand uh, the full wave function in one Oppenheim in a complete set of one Oppenheim states times the wave function. It's exactly the same. A complete basis, and then unknown expand. And then I can insert this into the Schrodinger equation, and then I get a new Schrodinger equation for the unknown function. They look like this. Each we solve a Venetia. Uh, but to analyze it, we can also look at large distances. And this, uh, then these terms here uh, disappear, and we only have this term here, which is 
without any coupling. So this is also, of course, important to have no coupling at, at large eta. And uh, then, since eta here is large, we can ask ourselves, I, how does the solution look like at large eta? And uh, to find such solutions to such differential equations at large eta, for example, in this case, there is uh, various techniques. Uh, there is a technique called method of dominant balancing, which is uh, a nice technique. Um, and uh, if you apply that technique, you get this solution. And if you don't want to look up uh, how to uh, use that uh, technique, you can also verify, because I've now told you this is a solution. And if you don't trust me, you can take this and insert. But of course, if I hadn't given you this, it would be difficult to figure out what to insert into the equation. So there are techniques to find this type of flow. And now we're almost there. This was my general expansion, a function of eta, a function of psi. The function of psi was expanded in all the channels. And this square root here, I uh, just include because it makes the differential operators more convenient. Uh, so now at this point you may stop and say, what on earth is he talking about? I wanted to calculate the rate. Where did the rate go in all this discussion? And this is now these <laughs> equations here that tell you about the rate. So of course the rate here, so if now this is positive set and this is negative set, then I want to ask how, what is the number of particles per time that go uh, out here in this direction, at last negative set. It's the integral over the current in that uh, direction with a minus, uh, and then I integrate over at the plane of the uh, direction. So I need to calculate the current. I know the formula for the quantum mechanical current from my quantum mechanics course, and then I have to uh, use a chain rule to express uh, this differential operator in terms of heat instead of set. And then I also have to know something about this uh, area here in the new coordinates. And this uh, I did for you here. And then one possible task, if you want, is to uh, take this uh, wave function here, calculate the current, calculate the integral, and then you obtain this result. This means that in this tunneling theory, this <coughs> function here is the important object. So this is now what we want to get. And now it's getting really technical, and there's no way I can uh, tell you how this can be done in, in, the, in a one-hour talk. So there, for the interested reader or listener, I refer to the paper again, and uh, I now give you the recipe of obtaining the result. The recipe is that you should take uh, the solution here that we have obtained as a general solution, and you should then look at it uh, in the classically allowed region, which was the region uh, <coughs> out here. Out here. Then you can actually solve for this unknown function out there. And then you continue that solution to the classically uh, uh, forbidden region, which is here. <coughs> so, there's a way to do that. We can discuss that this evening if you like. Uh, and then, <coughs> now you have the solution here, and then you match that solution to uh, the initial bound state, which is this object here, which, uh, which of course also now has to be expressed in these new coordinates. So, so all this can be done, and, and uh, uh, with these instructions, it's possible to verify these equations, which are the central equations in that paper. I just did this before this talk to make sure I could still do it. So, <laughs> how it's possible to do. Now, uh, and the end result is this. So now, in this equation, <coughs> uh, if I take the norm square of this, it is uh, the rate <coughs> in a given channel. So let's just look at that rate in a given channel a little bit what we get out from that equation. If I take the norm square of this, I get um, the rate of going into that channel nu. So it is, uh, say, d nu squared. 
and then it is uh, e to the minus two kappa mu z e to the minus uh, two kappa q divided by three f and some other terms here, right? Uh, and all of this here with these other terms is just a simple function of the field. It's called the WDF, the field factor. And then the rest here is a molecular property. It tells you something about if the system is, has a dipole, how is that dipole oriented with respect to the molecule? You see, if, the if this mu z, which is the z component of the molecular dipole, is positive, it meaning that the dipole is in the same direction as the field, it's more difficult to ion. So this here is related to the energy field. And then this one here is related to the uh, asymptotic form of the wave function here. So this here is the asymptotic position. So these, these two here, uh, these two guys here, we call uh, maybe capital D mu, and we call that the structure function. So in, in the tuning theory now, we have actually identified uh, in this leading order that we ha always have a field factor and we have a unique uh, uh, molecular specific uh, <coughs> factor. And this is now a property which is unique for any molecule. This means that you can calculate this and put it into tables, if you like, like put a stability into dipoles. So, so this, this we have done it for um, maybe 50 different diatomic molecules. We have <coughs> a catalog uh, of all these structure factors in atomic and nuclear data tables. <coughs> to, to, to give you some more physics on this, it's, I think it's also nice to make this drawing here again. I made a drawing here, here's the effective potential. And I now want to investigate two cases. <clears throat> so here in case A, I have a molecule oriented like this. In case B, I have a molecule oriented like this. In both cases, the field is in this direction. In this case, the dipole. <laughs> in this case, the dipole is like this. In this case, the dipole is like this. Because the, di the definition of the dipole is that the dipole goes from most negative to less negative. And this, this was an attempt of showing a lot of electrons here on this end and not too much on this end. And then the opposite. So, in this case, the field and the external field, sorry, the external field and dipole are in the same direction. It means that the ionization potential is larger because of the lowering of the energy. So, it should be more difficult to ion if I just look at the tunneling exponent. In this case, it's opposite because here the field is like this and the dipole is like this. I have a raising of the energy. It's easier to ionize. But there is another effect, namely that here you have a lot of this, you have have a lot of density close to the tunnel exit. So this is what now I have discussed this geometry and energy. It's just to show you or tell you that it's not just the phase. It's not just the exponent. It's also, in fact. This object here, which tells you something about how that object looks like at large distances. So this is what I wanted to tell you about uh, this weak field asymptotic theory, and uh, this is the formula that you can use most often, and the, the, where you have this uh, structure factor and you have a field factor, which is essentially the one I just showed you. Over here. Um, and the uh, nice thing about that is that it uh, is consistent with all the other theories on the map. And uh, I think due to time we skip this now here. So this is just a summary of the formulas. Um, we can also calculate it a lot here. If any of you, how many of you are from time to time using uh, quantum chemistry codes? One? Yeah. Okay, so in a quantum chemistry code you work with Gaussian optimals or ga Gaussian basis. How, how do you think Gaussian basis sets? Uh, how do you think they, they? Do you think they're good at representing stuff that is far away from the origin? No. 
you don't, uh, and this is this is one problem. So uh, this type of theory that relies on things that are far away from the origin requires careful quantum chemistry treatment. But uh, we have uh, in our department Frank Jensen, who is very good quantum chemistry person, and he he has uh, he has some techniques to get stable behavior. So you don't need to know what is on those new drugs. It's just illustrating that if you just uh, use quantum chemistry programs like black box you run into problems. But this you would do with any type of time theory. And one small note here is that the same formulas can be written up, in fact, for a in electron system. Uh, so this is now a many electron theory of time. And uh, the formulas look the same and you you can also look at this like a this like abstract Picasso picture. It's not important exactly what it is. The important thing is that it's the same as before, essentially, except that the orbital, which is now coming into the theory, is the so-called Dyson orbital, which is the overlap. Well, it's not the overlap. It's what is left after you have integrated n minus one electrons out from an n electron wave function. So um, then I want to spend the last couple of minutes uh, discussing. Uh, nuclear motion. And here I will spare you from uh, the derivation of formulas, but more give you the hope to give you some uh, physical uh, feeling of what can be expected. So, uh, we, we have in, in uh, AMO physics many situations where the von Oppenheim approximation is extremely accurate. We can calculate ground state energies to any precision. Uh, but we also have at the same time uh, a series of manifestations when the von Oppenheim approximation break down. Uh, so, as you know, uh, for example, we can take this last example here. So, the von Oppenheim breaks down in the Why is that? It's because it's assumed in the von Oppenheim approximation that the electron moves fast compared to the nuclear, which moves slow. But if the electron is in a Rydberg, it's also moving extremely slow. So then, eventually, it will move maybe even slower than the nuclear. So you could have inverse from all that. But anyway. And, so, and there are also other cases here at avoided crossings and conical intersections. These are all manifestations of the same thing, namely that the energy separation between the electronic energy levels become very small and comparable to typical energy separations in the, in the nuclear problem. And, and now what I, the, the intriguing point that I want to make here is that in fact in, in tunneling uh, you will always switch to regime where the von Oppenheim breaks down for particular field strengths. And so to, to show to do that calculation we chose a simple model. So we because this we illustrate uh, in the model. So here we have the uh, nuclear motion and here we have the electron motion. And here we have the Schrödinger equation for the combined system. So this is now coming back to one of the questions. So this is the kinetic energy operator of the electron. This is the kinetic energy operator of the nuclei. And these are the potentials. And the interaction with the external field. And this is the energy that we have, which is now a function of f and therefore complex. So therefore, the solution should be in this form where we have this rate. And then, <clears throat> when we did some calculations, well, okay, for some technical reasons, it was easier to use some good approximations to the uh, H2 and H2 plus curves. Uh, and then we got these results here. Let's focus on the top view graph. Here I have the field strength. Here I have the rate divided by this field factor, which I have uh, over here on the, on the whiteboard. Um, and uh, this curve here is the exact result for, the, for this uh, number here as a function of field strength. And then I have also uh, our theory, this weak field asymptotic theory, it can also be extended to the nuclear motion. It's the blue one. It's not too bad. And then we have the von Oppenheim approximation, which is OK at large if, but breaks down here, maybe you will say it breaks down here and behaves badly at lower field strengths. And this effect is uh, also present at uh, 
higher nuclear mass, but it uh, happens, uh, and it happens even uh, earlier in these things. So this is what came out of this, and then now I want to explain why, what is the physical origin of this breakdown of the process. On the right hand side here, you have one hour the rate, so this is just number three. So this is like the decay time. So if the field is very large, you have a small decay time. Uh, and the solution to this uh, breakdown of the Bonhoeffer is uh, retardation effect. So here you have the nuclei, <coughs> they move on a time scale, say one half per race period, which scales by square root of mass. Uh, now the exit point, which we calculated earlier, it was called set naught in my initial slide, is given by the isolation potential of the field. So this is the exit point. And then I can ask myself, how long time does it take for the electron to reach this uh, exit point? Well, it's, uh, it's one half times acceleration times time squared. It's this formula here. From this I get the time. Now, if the time it takes for the electron to get to the exit point is the same or comparable to the time it takes for the nuclear to vibrate, the electron motion is no longer fast compared to the operating motion. So therefore, you would expect that if these two are similar, uh, mathematically we just put them equal, then I would expect the breakdown of the form of So I take uh, <coughs> this t here, and I take this uh, delta t here, and then I can get the field, and uh, the field scales like 1 over square root m, and that's this thing you see here. Um, so this is the reservation. Okay. There are some newer papers on all this common theory. Um, it turns out that including new, what we work on act active, act actively now uh, is to do more on nuclear motion. This has, has, uh, had, this has not been done, to my knowledge, in, in a, in a, in a in a way where you try to include that at the same level as the electron motion. So this is what we're trying to do now uh, analytically also. And uh, let's look at the outlook. Funding is the initial key step. I have given you a lot of formulas with the, <laughs> with the hope that you should now be uh, better prepared to understand what enters the theory of funding and therefore you should also better understand when you can apply it and when you can not. Uh, Tunneling theory is needed to interpret results of total ionization yield as function of molecular ionization. Tunneling theory is used in combination with classical propagation, or maybe with or without action phases, so you can do a little bit better. This here, I think, is true. Uh, the tunneling theory for molecules, including nuclear motion, is not well explored, but it's very relevant and timely to do. In the 90s, there were papers also from Paul on uh, imaging of vibration wave patterns. The interpretation was, in some classical terms, what are the quantum effects from the type of reasoning that I have followed in this talk? That's one of the questions that is driving us presently. And please, uh, if you like, think about <laughs> the exercises, think about the secret state, the weak field, the dipole stuff, stuff, the separation, the matching, the geometry. Think about the von Oppenheimer. It's really stimulating to think about these timescales also when we have the external field. And uh, with that, I'd like to th uh, thank again also the collaborators on these type of funding things, and also the experimentalists, which I didn't mention here, but from time to time we've been lucky to collaborate with experimentalists. Uh, that's great pleasure. And also I'd like to thank the funding agencies. Yes, that's it. Yeah, we have time for a few more questions, yeah. Um, yes, so what you showed was for small gamma. So you you took the field somehow as a parameter that should an equation and you introduce this complex energy E of F. So can you 
make some statement what could happen or can can one somehow express or solve or find some draw some conclusions about what happens when gamma comes close to one and so the field is somehow time dependent but not very fast. So <coughs> where, where does it break down at this point? Yeah, this, this, uh, in, in this talk in no, in, 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 in fact in time, exclusively in this talk I just assumed that the field was static. And, and, and your question is about when is that a good approximation? And, and this I only mentioned briefly, uh, briefly saying that maybe this Kildis parameter should be small. And I also said that it's not enough that that's small. You also need to have a frequency which is small compared to the binding energy of the electron. So that the electron moves extremely fast while the field changes the direction. Um, but I have not uh, quantified under what circumstances this tunnel theory is, is uh, correct. This can be done. Uh, rigorously in something called uh, adiabatic theory, which is um, which has been developed by Ulrich Stiefel here and uh, so, uh, and that's uh, beyond the scope of this talk to go into. It. And I can I cannot give you a better, more clear answer at this point. But it's a matter of looking at these parameters, omega or e naught. And then look at the corrections. Okay, but uh, is there any way to somehow <coughs> solve this problem or tackle this problem in the intermediate regime where you are not strictly adaptive? Yeah, then you introduce more and more non adiabatic uh, corrections, of course. And then, so, then we always have the TDSE if we have only one electron we can solve, <laughs> we can solve it. Uh, so no, I, I think it's, it's, there is no uh, there is no easy way to, to do that. There is no easy way. To do that. You, you, it, it also depends on what you want to do uh, as a theoretician. I mean, you can of course uh, always design and build up some model somehow that can capture some things, uh, but uh, a lot of that uh, does not necessarily follow directly from the Schrodinger equation. If you want to search, and, but it could be fine to do it because if you can compare with the experiments and you can see and you can explain this and this, it's, it's of course uh, perfectly uh, justified. But it's also related to a matter of working style. If you want to try to do things that follow more or less rigorously from the Schrodinger equation, or if you want to build by hand. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the structure factor. Yes. The two states. So you can also have intermediate cases, right? Sure. Uh, so yeah. Well, there's, there's a different name between yeah. the two. So is that monotonic between those two, or is there minimums or maximums as it? Is that When, when we do the calculation, we have to calculate that structure factor for each annotation. So, so if you um, <coughs> if if I, if I have a three D object, I want to specify how it's oriented in space. I need three angles. Uh, typically, we use the Euler angles. So, if I think about rotation around the laboratory set axis, rotation around the new y-axis and then rotation around the new surfaces. That's delta beta and gamma or theta phi or whatever. Uh, so now in our case, um, I think you can see that uh, it cannot depend on alpha because the field is in the And in some cases, it's also independent of rotation around the regular axis. Right? Because if it's, for example, a simple state, there's, there's no way I can see. So then it's only this beta angle, namely the angle between the field and the wave factors. So, so, but then we have to calculate the structure factor for its uh, value of uh, beta. 
So this, and this can be done. And then what we have done, for example, in one of these page in this catalog, in this, in this catalog here, where you find most diatomics, you, you, you get coefficients which you uh, multiply by the shadow for numbers, and then you can construct the all the stock effects which you need. Yeah. 